Does a fly represent the meaning of life? Let's talk about the fly by Catherine Mansfield coming up today. Oh, wow. Okay. Bzz me over there. <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, two friends that talk about literature. My name is Una. And I am Crypto. So this story brings us to London, right? We have a London newspaper. We have sausages and whiskey are hard to come by. So it kind of implies maybe a post-World War conversation. It was published in 1922 for the setting, right? Okay, okay. And we have two characters. We've got Mr. Woodyfield, who looks like a child from his pram. <laughs> He's like the funniest character ever, and I don't think it was written supposed to be that way, but I giggle every time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's looked after by his kids and wife and seems like he's he's kind of in need of assistance, right? Like he had to quit his job because of this stroke, that sort of thing. But then kind of like opposite to him, maybe maybe not the exact same, but maybe not the exact opposite. But we have the boss, the unnamed boss, who flips through the Financial Times he, which is the London newspaper, he uh, just got done redoing his office with new carpet, new heater. Check me out. He's a man of progress and one to be admired. But why pit these two against each other? I don't know. Maybe they're pitted against each other because deep down we're all the same underneath. Why do you say that? Well, in the story, we see a lot of parallels drawn between the two characters. And in the end, they both get kind of distracted and forget who they are, right? Why do you think they might get distracted? This is where I'm not really sure, like, what was the point of the fly and why did he let himself get distracted with it? All right, well, let's do a little bit of a recap because I think I think there's a very specific reason why he keeps distracting himself, which I kind of want to talk through. So in the city, the boss and his former employee, Mr. Woodyfield, have this weekly social visit. Right. And Mr. Woodyfield's like so excited to get away from his wife and kids for a little bit. Like literally he seems like a prisoner to them. And like the boss seems like that guy that kind of like gets off on his power. Right. Like, look what I just redid. I did all I just redid this heater, the carpeting. Check out this place. Ooh, look at my desk. Yeah, my big desk. But there's one thing he avoids, and that's this picture. Right. So the boss pulls out some whiskey and Woodyfield mentions that he's just been to Europe or his family has and they've seen his son's grave as well. And that's when the boss becomes quieter. And after Woodyfield leaves, the boss requests to be left alone, you know, from the, the secretary. He's kind of wants a half hour to himself and a fly lands in his ink pot where the boss kind of puts a pen down to get him out. And then as the fly cleans himself off, he puts more ink on this fly and rinse repeat, right? He keeps <laughs> dousing this fly with ink until it it's dies, a little, basically. a little morbid, right? It's like, oh, sociopath. <laughs> and then he's just like, what was I thinking about again? Oh, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> and it's like, dog, squirrel. <laughs> so let's talk about why he might be distracting himself here, right? Because the picture that he was distracting himself, right? We have the quote, it was a grave looking boy in uniform, right? And then the girls, when they were traveling, they mentioned they saw poor Reggie's grave and they happened to come across your boys, as in your boy's grave, we saw as well, meaning that we probably are meant to suspect that this man's son died in perhaps some type of a service, right? It says he's wearing a uniform. And uh, like we said earlier, whiskey, sausages are on short supply. It's kind of hard to get them, maybe. That this might be the post-World War I conversation where this man lost his son in the war, potentially. Okay, I m missed on the sausages, World War I whiskey connection, and then the possessive of boys. The boys, that the applies, yeah, the, the boss's son. Okay, now it's fitting together. All right. So, okay, so let's talk about why he may be like this, because he's clearly, like, highlighting these material possessions. But is it to avoid thinking about the son? Is it he's trying to avoid humanity, and he's trying to think about material possessions? That's something that I kind of want to explore with you here today. Because you'll notice that Mr. Woodyfield has a family. Right, these daughters that and wife that dote on him and protect him and don't let him go out, and he's had this stroke probably from stress from this war and everything, and they kind of like are protecting him as he's like the last thing in his life. But it's worth pointing out he has people in his life, but the boss seems to be more isolated. Fair statement. Oh, for sure. So they break out the whiskey, which is sometimes a sign of like 
letting your hair down, right? Like like letting loose, like finally opening up. But but they do drink to each other. But he talk, you know, the man talks about how his wife wouldn't allow it. I think it was something along those lines. And the guy says something very pejorative to women, like like, well, these women don't know better. Like us men, we know better, right? Uh, the, the, this cocky boss just seems to break off connections with other people. Right. So this man has these women in his life that dote on him, take care of him, maybe protect him too much. And the boss doesn't have that. Right. So how does he distance himself from not having that connection with humanity? And he he disparages him. Right. He puts down all oh, those women. They don't know as much as us men do is one way to look at that. Right. Yeah, I think that there's obviously this disconnect between I have the material possessions and not the family and you have the family, not the material possessions and maybe they're a little bit envious of each other maybe maybe a little bit well um we'll say this there's one other woman in the story do you remember who the secretary and do you remember how the boss describes her as very nice well he he kind of disparages her saying that you need to take her out and walk her like a dog like comparing her to a creature basically and this might be, again, part of his defense strategy of trying not to connect with other people, right? And okay. when, we, when we start to talk about like a post-war conversation, this man, why was he building up all this wealth? Well, there's that talk about him potentially trying to pass it down to his son. How on earth could he have slaved, denied himself, kept going all those years without the promise forever before him of the boys stepping into his shoes? and carrying on where he left off. So you can see that he, his legacy, like the ability to hand off this company or even to dive into the company is not going to be able to be handed down to his son now because he lost it, right? And this man continually even cuts off his own sentences. Like he's interrupting himself where you have these quotes where he'll be like, <laughs> you artful little but," and then it dot, dot, dot. What was it? It was, he took out his handkerchief and passed it inside his collar for the life of him. He could not remember. So literally, this man keeps cutting off his own memories, his own connection to society. For what end? To dive further into the material possessions? To not feel all the emotions that he probably should have felt? Because it says that he didn't feel the loss for his son that he probably should have. Mm, so we're thinking maybe he has like PTSD and obviously he's not coping with it very well. His strategies are not functioning. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question, because does he have PTSD? Do we know if he served? Um, if there was a clue in there, I missed it. I, I wasn't. It wasn't clear to me that he served. But to your point about this, I don't know if Mansfield wrote it that he had PTSD, but he so certainly brief. came to he cur he came to thoughts of war a lot, right? When he's when he's talking about the the fly, he says, "Look sharp!" Exclamation point. And they use all these military terms about death, and, and, and it's very dramatic, the way the fly's like cleansing himself off. But, you know, you got to keep in mind that from, um, you know, from a biographical standpoint, Catherine Mansfield lost, I think it was her little brother in the war, that she probably okay. felt some grief, right? That's a good and, clue. And you can see how this man just doesn't know how to deal with this loss, and he's trying to maybe try and find meaning in the sense of war. We talk about how some writers in the post-war generation, in particular World War II, Kurt Vonnegut, they couldn't find meaning. What was the point of all of this? It just it felt like there really wasn't a point, and they're searching for what that point is. And that might be maybe how the man views this fly that comes into his life, right? It gets ink covered all over him and jumps into the ditches and mud, kind of like war, you know, people drafted did. And he's trying to cleanse himself off and he kind of sees this fly like joyfully cleaning himself off. It might be kind of like a search for meaning in a sense. Yeah, for me, I guess uh, it, grief, loss, the sacrifice of war. I, I really like the idea of being in the trenches and the ink. I, I like that connection there. Uh, I think it's open to a lot of interpretation, right? I mean, it's pretty ambiguous about, about what this could yeah. be. Yeah, if you had a different takeaway, we'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. Like, you don't have to have assumed the same thing that we did. But one thing that I thought was kind of interesting about this is how the man sadistically kept treating the fly with with drowning him in this ink, right? It's almost kind of like with the look sharp and all the commands, maybe he viewed himself kind of like the, the war mongols, the people in charge of the war, sending younger people off to die, and this fly being a symbolic representation of it. 
who knows what Mansfield was thinking, and I don't know if it matters, right? What matters is how do we view this man's sadistic treatment of the fly? And we have the quote, he's a plucky little devil, thought the boss, and he felt a real admiration for the fly's courage. That was the way to tackle things. That was the right spirit. Never say die. It was only a question of, but the fly had again finished its laborious task. And you can see even all within that one little quote, it's you have the person telling other people what to do, putting, you know, strings and controls of their life. You have him talking about the never say die attitude, right? Which was a slogan for some of the wars and such. And then even then he cuts himself off mid-sentence too in the distracting himself from the feeling in the moment to try to disconnect himself from perhaps some of the pain and grief that he was experiencing from loss in his life. I also think a little bit maybe he's trying to gain some sense of control over his life. I mean, there, this obviously wasn't his choice in the matter, and um, we don't know a lot of the backstory of did the son, you know, get drafted? Did the son want this? Did the dad push him? I mean, there, there's a lot of motivation for somebody going off and enlisting in the military, and we don't know any of that information, so maybe the boss is you know, regretful, um, but trying to deal with that, that grief by having some semblance of control in his life. Yeah, or distracting himself with the material possessions. So it's a fun little story. I like it because um, it's it's one of emotions, I would say, because it's never really clear. Like like you said, some people could totally miss the the son's grave part. And, the, the you know, you can, you can get a sense of how people feel connected underneath it, but not necessarily be able to articulate why. And that's OK. I think stories are what they mean to us and how do we reflect upon what they can mean. And we can learn from each other's experiences. So I'll leave a playlist down below for other Catherine Mansfield talks that we've had. We love discussing her. I think she writes great short stories. Oh, for sure. Yeah, she's a fantastic writer. I, I, I really love how it does bring out that emotion in one. And for me, I did know all the World War stuff. And being a history teacher, I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, I see that symbology. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get that. And that really helped open up the, the discussion of what the possibility of the fly meant. Oh, good. Good. Well, like we said, playlist down below, hit that subscribe button to join us as we talk about more literature in the future. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. Una out. Peace.